Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on which section of the country or world that you're listening in from. Welcome to today's Asa Abloy Academy virtual instructor-led training, how to read and use life safety plans. My name is Katie Flower. I will be your lead instructor for this afternoon session. And this session is worth one credit hour. You will receive an email thanking you for your attendance within 24 hours of attending the session. And you can use that for continuing education credit. You do need to self-report. If you have any questions at any time throughout this presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A button and submit your question. This one is going to be a little different. Instead of holding all the questions until the end, I will have one Q&A session after I go through a few PowerPoint slides before we get to looking at some actual life safety plans. And then when we're looking at the life safety plans, feel free to ask any questions at any time. I'll be monitoring them before I move on to the next one. There are many, many virtual instructor-led trainings as well as online classes on Osabloy Academy. So please feel free to check those out. This session is being recorded and will be posted on Osabloy Academy. Go to the virtual instructor-led training page and on the top right-hand corner, there is a link to all previously recorded sessions. You can review as frequently as you need to. So what are life safety plans? Why do we ask for life safety plans? Whether you're a specification consultant, an architectural consultant, a door hardware distributor supplier, or anybody that is trying to select appropriate code compliant hardware, life safety plans are vital. It's important to understand that not all life safety plans will look alike. Every architectural firm will have their own symbols and their own methodology with what information that they include. And not all life safety plans will have all of the same information, but there are things that you do need to look for. And you may need to ask the architect to confirm some things. We'll take a look briefly at each of these items and then I'll expand upon them. So what we're looking for when you ask for life safety plans, you wanna confirm the code addition. You may have a project that you're working on that is outside of your normal range and the life safety plans should indicate which code or codes that the project falls under. And even if you're familiar with your state and the code that has been adopted by your state, it's always best to take a look. Uh, there may be some reason why this particular project that you're working on falls under a different code. You wanna be able to find firewalls and uh, smoke ratings. Many times when you write a specification, you're in the early stages of design and the door schedule doesn't have all of the information on it at that point. And it may not have fire ratings or smoke ratings listed on the door schedule. Having the life safety plans is crucial. Confirm the occupancy types and look for mixed occupancies. You want to confirm occupant loads. They should be listed. Depending on the complexity of the project, it will show the occupant loads for you, but certainly it's something that you can calculate if you need to. You need to confirm paths of egress and access to exits, as well as the location of exits, and confirm what side is the egress side of the door, so that if the owner wants card readers on some doors, if you're locking a door in the path of egress, you may need to consider a special locking arrangement. And again, sometimes your door schedule doesn't have the notes where the magnetic hold opens are listed and the life safety plan will show them either with a symbol or even just calling it out with a note. You can confirm if the building is sprinklered or fully sprinklered or uh, not and that makes a difference in your hardware selection and depending on the area of the country that you're in there may be a storm shelter, a FEMA tornado shelter or something like that and that will be indicated on the life safety plans. And additionally, look for red flags, which will raise questions for the architect. Let's take a look at each one of these individually. 
So the building code is adopted into law either by your city, your state, or your jurisdiction. The life safety plan should list the code title and the year that is applicable for the project. You may have multiple codes that are listed, especially if it's healthcare. A lot of times in hospital work, you'll have more than one code, including NFPA 101, and they'll list the different years of the codes that are uh, in, in effect. And if you have more than one code, you have to follow the more restrictive requirements when it comes to selecting doors and hardware and their applicable requirements. Use the life safety plans to find fire walls and smoke ratings. If firewalls, each one of these has a distinct definition in the International Building Code. And there is a Asabloy virtual instructor led training that gets in depth. It's called Advanced Fire Doors. And it gets in depth on the definitions of these different types. But depending on where within the building, you will see these on the life safety plan and they'll be shown with different symbols so that you can tell the difference between them. And sometimes they'll have a color. And if they don't have a color, I like to use my highlighter, whether it's in Bluebeam or Adobe uh, PDF viewer or whatever that you're using to view the PDF, typically you can mark them up with whatever you need. Firewalls are gonna be three hour doors. Fire barriers will be either 45, 60 or 90 minute doors. If they're part of an exit enclosure, they're going to be 60 or 90 minute. If they are more like a storage room, then it would be the 45 minute type door. Fire partitions, you'll find either 20 or 45 minute rated doors. And again, it depends on the location within the building and what is being protected. Smoke barriers will be a one hour wall with 20 minute doors, unless by exception. And smoke partitions are non-fire rated. There are some that based on the occupancy will have exceptions. So you may have smoke barriers in a hospital that do not require positive latching, or you may have doors in a smoke barrier that do not require a door closer and possibly no fire rating at all. Those will be, that's why it's important to know the occupancy type and use all of this information together also, you're gonna be on the lookout for pressurized stairs in high-rise buildings. You're looking for atriums that may include smoke evacuation systems that could require some doors to have power operators. Instead of having power operators that open the doors for you, these will blow open. You'll use the blow open feature of the power operator at the time of the fire. Instead of closing, they wanna be open to allow cool air in. All of these things you can find on the life safety plan. You wanna confirm the occupancy types and whether or not you have a mixed occupancy. Based on, uh, the code is based on ordinary risk, moderate risk, and then if it's considered high risk, the high risk occupancies are group A assembly, group E educational, which is K through 12, including nursery school, and group H is high hazard, all of those are high risk and those types of occupancies have more restrictions than what the code is written around, which is ordinary moderate risk. Those include group B business, group M mercantile, factory, storage, and residential occupancies. And then a lower risk occupancy type is group I institutional, where you have staff, the patients or the people that are in the group I institutional occupancies are not capable of self-preservation. So it's a detention or correctional facility, it's a hospital, it's a nursing home, an assisted living facility, and those types, because of the presence of staff and the buildings are full sprinklered by mandate, they're considered lower risk and you are able to lock the door on the egress side in those types of occupancies. Other considerations, you wanna confirm occupant loads. Sometimes a room or a space, especially if it's a multi-purpose room or a dining room, something that could be assembly that looks large, you wanna confirm the occupant load. The life safety plan should show you and indicate what that occupant load is. And some of the code requirements that are based on occupant load, 
when you have 50 or more people in a room, an area, or space, the side hinge pivoted swinging doors need to swing in the direction of egress. You can use manual sliding doors if the occupant load is 10 or less. So it's important to know if you've got an office or a conference room, what the occupant load is. If it says 15 and the owner wants a sliding door, the architect has a sliding door drawn, that's a red flag, that's a question. That door needs to be a swinging door. It could swing in, but it cannot be a sliding door if there's more than 10 people. The minimum number of exits is two, except for 49 or less is permitted to have one exit. And in some cases, it needs to be 10 or less to, to be considered one exit. There is a table in the IBC that indicates that. And when we get to 500 or more people between 501 and 1,000, you need a minimum of three exits. And once you have more than 1,000 people, then you need four exits. And it's always good to confirm, based on the occupant load, how many exits there are. Exit devices are required when you have assembly and educational occupancies of 50 or more people, whether it's from a room or a space or from the building. Double cylinder deadbolts are permitted on the main entry door of group A assembly when you have 300 or less people for business occupancies, mercantile without any occupant. It doesn't matter what the occupant load is there, but the key benchmark for group A assembly is 300 or less and the main entry only. Manual flush bolts are permitted from IBC 2012 and beyond. So 2015 and 2018 also permit manual flush bolts when you have a business occupancy with 49 or less, unless it's fully sprinklered. And then in that case, it doesn't matter what the occupant load is. And one other thing that uh, if both leaves of a fire rated pair are required for exit purposes, then both leaves are required to have exit devices and that's regardless of the occupancy type. And how can you tell if both leaves are required for exit purposes? That's based on the occupant load. A three foot wide door that's inch and three quarter thick that's hung on either butt hinges, pivots, or continuous hinges has 33 inches of clear opening space. And so based on a table in chapter 10 of means of egress, that tells me that a three foot wide door can exit 165 people in a non-sprinkler building. If I have more than 165, then that means I'm going to have to have both leaves of the pair of doors used for egress purposes. You wanna confirm the paths of egress and access to exits. And that includes stair re-entry. If you've got a re-enter at this point, you need to have access to this other stair. And that means you're gonna to have to go through this elevator lobby. And those doors have gotta be unlocked at the time of fire to give access to this stair. Other uh, intervening spaces, you may have corridor doors where I have to go through this door in order to reach the stair that you can't see on the, on the screen. And if that's the case, then this door cannot be locked at the time of fire. And same thing with intervening spaces. If I go from one room to another room to get out to the main corridor, that door cannot be subject to locking. Are the exit access doors separated and remote from each other? The rule of thumb that the code says is one half the diagonal of the area or space. They need to be separated from each other by half of that distance. If I've got 100 feet for my diagonal, that means my doors have got to be a minimum of 50 feet apart. If it's a fully sprinkler building, they cut that down to one third the diagonal of the area or space. And then the doors can be a little closer together. Are there any areas with common path of travel that may be exceeded? And some of these terms you may not be familiar with. There are other Osobloid virtual instructor led training classes that review these concepts. And I recommend, highly recommend, if you aren't sure that you take a look at those. You wanna confirm the location of exits Exit stairs are exits. 
horizontal exits or double egress doors in a rated smoke barrier part, uh, wall and areas of refuge. Those will all be indicated on the life safety plan and very commonly they'll be highlighted or you'll see from the dash pattern what the rating of the wall is. You need to confirm the egress side of the door. This affects hardware selection and which side can be locked or which side has to be considered free egress. You can tell from the life, life safety plan based on the location of lighted exit signs. They have symbols for the lighted exit signs, which direction is the arrow pointing. The direction of your egress path could be both directions, it could be multiple directions. You've got to pretend that you're in the building and walk along the corridor with your mind and is that door locked in the direction of egress? And if it is, you may need to use a special locking arrangement. The code has four different electromechanical special locking arrangements that do permit locking of the door from the egress side. Some of them are infinite, some of them are for 15 seconds, delayed egress, and others are needing some kind of sensor release or door hardware release from the egress side and tied to the fire alarm system. But without this information, you can't really write a code compliant hardware set and you certainly can't write a proper operations narrative that somebody could hardwire that system and make it code compliant. The location of magnetic hold open devices, they may not be shown on the door schedule, but they should be shown on the life safety plan. And it could be a symbol, it could be a note, it could be just initials, but those are things that you wanna take a look for. Additionally, if confirm if the building is sprinklered or fully sprinklered or not, it changes your door width requirements based on the occupant load. And it also allows for exceptions for certain hardware selection, for example, delayed egress and some of our other special locking arrangements. And last but not least, you wanna look for red flags. It's much easier to change something while it's still on paper. And you're probably thinking if you're a distributor, you're a supplier, an architectural or specification consultant, that you don't have to do the architect's job for them. They're the professional and that's true. But based on experience, and I worked with, I've worked with architects my entire 36 year career, but as a specification consultant, and architectural consultant for 11 years, I know that they appreciate the heads up. If you see something that doesn't look right, if you see something, say something. There may be a logical explanation based on a factor that you're unfamiliar with, but it doesn't hurt to ask the question and at least let the architect take a look at it. But if the building gets built with some kind of code deficiency, whether it gets by, it could even get by the AHJ. Everybody's busy, everybody is trying their best, but things do slip through the cracks and get approved when they probably shouldn't. And we see them when we walk down hallways, we look at hardware and say, how in the heck was that approved? But if it gets built correctly to begin with, then you're part of making that built environment a safer place for occupants, people that are there especially if it's a high risk assembly or educational occupancy, you have just, it doesn't take long to raise the question to the architect. And again, let them take a look at it. You're not trying to dictate, you have to make this change, but you do want to at least let them know that you think there may be an issue. And before we get into the actual life safety plans, I do want to let you know that there is a new tool, the Osobloy egress calculator. We may or may not use this today when I'm going through the life safety plans. It depends on if you want to see an example or not, but it is a tool that you can use on your desktop, a tablet or smartphone. It's based on the International Building Code. You can use the drop down menu to select the year anywhere from IBC 2006 all the way to the 2018 edition. And it calculates the occupant load, the egress width, the quantity of exits, the swing direction of doors, all with quick reference to code compliant hardware to help point you in the right direction where you look in the code for that. 
You can also download and save your input and output data in a PDF form. We do have training classes coming up. The next one is September 17th on calculating occupant loads and egress width, and you get a copy, a link to this, but it is a very, very powerful tool. I'm gonna to take a look to see if there's any questions right now before we move on to the actual life safety plans. There's a question, but I'm going to answer it offline. I'll send you an email individually. We have any other, any other questions before we get into actually looking at some plans? Okay, so if you have any questions as we are looking through these, please feel free to go ahead and type them in at any time. This first one is a large high school and you can see that it's, it's got the overall view. This is the code analysis for the first floor. And these little fire symbols with the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, those are all fire compartments. And we can see some kind of heavy lines here which are separating the compartments. A fire compartment or a smoke compartment is limited to a maximum of 22,500 square feet. And so whether we're using fire barriers or smoke barriers, you're separating the large building into smaller fire compartments and smoke compartments. So if the fire originates here, this protection will keep the fire from spreading to the rest of the building. And it will help get people out of the building that aren't in the area of fire origin. That's the design. And if we scroll up, it's going to take just a second for this to load. Here we go. This is the main first page. So right away, I can see that this is from IBC 2018. And that's very different from what the state has adopted. The state that this project is in has adopted the IBC 2012. But for whatever reason, this project is being built to IBC 2018. That's why the life safety plan is critical. You wanna make sure which code edition that you have in force for the project area. And it may be different from what your state has. And it's important to, to take a look at that. The other parts of the legend that we're looking at this tells us egress width required doors 0.2 times the occupant load. This all comes right out of chapter 10 of the IBC. And then we've got some plumbing fixtures. We can skip over the plumbing fixtures. The occupant load factors that they use in these plans, this is straight out of the IBC, but it's reiterating for you whether they consider the assembly concentrated or standing or unconcentrated you can see exactly what factor without having to guess what they're using to determine whether it's educational or assembly or business. And here's our rated construction legend. There's only two different types for this particular project. We have one hour fire barriers and many times architects will use this convention. One dot as a separation of the lines is a one hour fire barrier and two dots indicates two hour fire wall or fire barrier. And when you see these designations on the plans, you can tell immediately whether it's one hour or two hour, and you know that the doors are going to be fire rated. It makes mention of the fireman's Knox box. Not every life safety plan does. Um, and then it gives you any kind of other notes on energy, your typical UL rated assembly numbers, any kind of notes, and, and you're looking just to see if there's anything that could affect the door hardware or the door selection. And then this even gets into the uh, type of construction in the building area, which you may not even need to look at, but it's there for all different design professionals to use. Let's go through and 
look at the next page. And on the next page, we're actually going to see some classrooms and we see some dotted lines with our egress travel. So from any, the furthest point, the most remote point, they show you the travel distance. And depending on if the building is sprinklered or non-sprinklered, that travel distance will be a different maximum. But we see this pair of doors in the corridor and they're not double egress, which means to me that this is the path of egress to get out. I go this way and not this way. So let's take a look. Does that look right to me? From every section, we need a minimum of two exits. So from this section, these are not considered exits because the doors don't swing in the proper direction. And I've got 27 occupant load in this classroom plus another 27 plus another 27. I have more than 50 people from this section. In fact, if we add them all up, we've got a couple hundred. As long as it's less than 500, I need two exits. Here's one and here's the other. Are these separated enough? It looks like they are. The diagonal of this space would go from here down to here. And for a sprinkler building, they just need to be one third the diagonal distance apart. So if I were writing a specification, I know that I could lock the door from this side and provide free egress from this side. Let's take a look at what, the, what does this symbol mean? It says 68 on top with a 55 on the bottom. What does that mean? There is a legend over here, which tells us that the top number is the provided width in inches and the bottom is the required width in inches. So we provided, this architect provided 68 inches minimum clear width for this pair of doors. And based on the occupant load, they only need this to be 55 inches clear. They've got an additional 13 inches of egress capacity which is great. It's always better to have something larger than it needs to be rather than smaller. If it's smaller, it should be a red flag. And so at this point, if I'm specifying the hardware, it doesn't matter whether there's a mullion in the center, a, a removable mullion in my hardware set. I've got 13 inches to play with. And so I'm not going to be deterring either leaf if I have a removable mullion there. Now, if this said 68 as a uh, pr providing 68 and a requirement of 68, then I really need to take a look at whether they calculated that with or without a removable mullion. But because we're not even close, I don't need to think about it. What else can we tell by looking? I want to look down here. I've so very similar, we just went through that exercise where these doors are swinging this way instead of double egress and determine that because we have two separate exits from this space, we don't need to come back in this direction. These doors don't have to be double egress and they're fine as drawn. When we see two doors side by side, two pairs of doors side by side, this is considered one exit and it's considered one exit because these doors are not separated by enough distance to be considered two separate exits. This is a separate exit and this is a separate exit. So I have three exits from this side plus I have a fourth exit access door which leads to this exit down here. I even have an additional exit that I can get to from this side. But counting the number of exits, if two doors or, or multiple doors are side by side by side like this, that's considered one exit. This is the dining area. And the dining area shows us an occupant load of 1,762 people. We also have uh, this little stair area. It looks like it might be a stage where we have 146 occupants from the floor above. So you would have to total these two together. 
do you remember how many exits that you need? I don't want you to type this in, but I want you to just think about it. How many exits do you need when we have over a thousand people? That answer was, we need four exits. So if I scroll out and I take a look, here's one, here's two, here's my third, coming around this corner down this hall, and here's my fourth coming around the corner and down this hall. So from this dining area, this very large assembly space, I have the four exits that I need and I would need to put exit devices on all of those doors. And in fact, in a school, you really want to have exit devices on all of your corridor doors you're going to have exit devices on all your exterior doors that swing out of the building that serve the main egress hallways. And then there's other, uh, they show some of the calculations with the total occupant load, the total egress capacity provided. You can see the uh, firewalls here, this, if you remember the symbol, there's one dash there, one dot. This is a one hour protected storage area and very low occupant load. There's only one person. Most storage rooms are considered unoccupied, but this is uh, fire rated, whereas these walls are non-fire rated. Here's another firewall and it is through here. So this is only one section of this very large high school. You would have to look at your continuity and make sure that the, the doors in this corridor should be fire rated to match the same as this. Now this gym also happens to double as a storm shelter. It is for use for if there is a tornado, the entire school will gather into this gym and the entire perimeter is protected. It's built and these doors, any door that is in this perimeter needs to be a FEMA rated FEMA 361 storm shelter with the appropriate hardware. They will need exit devices because our gym has Well, I'm sorry, that was on a different page, but there's 600 uh, bench seating here for the bleachers, another 600 here plus another 100. We're over 1,300 as an occupant load for the gym. So we need four exits. Here's one, here's two, here's three, and then there's four and there's actually five. So we need a minimum of four and they're providing five. But any of these doors that are in the main perimeter of the storm shelter will need to be the FEMA 361 doors. All right, I've got a question. When you have a double egress opening, is the full width of the entire opening used for both areas of egress if you have two on the plans or is only the width of the opening swinging correctly in the path of egress used? You're correct. It's only the single door in the path of egress that's used. And, and that's why with double egress, you're going to have multiple exits in order, depending on your occupant load, the doors either may need to be wider or maybe you need to have two double egress pairs side by side. Or sometimes I've even seen four double egress doors side by side by side that's gonna depend on the occupant load and your traffic in each direction. Any other questions on this school before I move on to the next set of life safety plans? Oh, I do wanna point out one more thing. with the classrooms. You see how this classroom, it, it tells us the occupant load factor of 20 square foot or 
20 net square foot per person. I have 771 square feet. If I divide 771 by 20, that gives me a occupant load of 39. But the TEA occupant load is 27. There are school districts in Arkansas and Texas, and I'm sure all across the country, where for the physical distance of what a student needs is larger than what the occupant load factor is. And there is a part in chapter 10 for means of egress that says that the posted occupant load, as long as it's approved by the AHJ, can actually be lower. And in this case, 27 is the actual occupant load. There will be a sign posted maximum number of students 27 or maximum occupant load 27 there will be a sign on each of these classrooms because again for the health reasons the spacing is going to be larger the room could technically fit more people but the means of egress capacity will be based on the actual number and that's why you see the difference here so if i'm writing this specification these classroom doors can swing in because the occupant load is less than 50 and I don't need exit devices on these doors. If this were an occupant load of 52, but the TEA occupancy said 36, I still wouldn't need exit devices because you go based on what the actual occupancy is. That's something that is pretty much just for schools. I don't believe I've ever seen anybody get an occupant load for less than what the factor is other than a school classroom. And that's for health, that's for health reasons uh, way long before COVID. So the next one I wanna take a look at is an office building. It's just a uh, two-story office building. We see the, I'm sorry, just a one-story office building. We see the layout. I'm going to scroll in and take a look at the code compliance notes first. The one that I've got highlighted, uh, indicated exit sign locations and quantities are approximate. More precise locations and additional quantities may be required by the AHJ. Confirm the locations before providing them. Uh, while that doesn't have much to do with us, it does let us know that the lighted exit signs may change and this is the symbol for the exit sign the exit sign is for egress intent only this would indicate which side the arrow is facing so this would be the egress side of this door pointing this way this one you see the arrow is pointing this way so the lighted exit sign will be hanging down from the ceiling so that somebody from here can see it they know that there's an exit door right around the corner, exit access door. They can walk over here, walk through here. Then they see this exit sign and they walk through this door here. So that's what that symbol means. It shows us which side is the egress side. And that's important because if the owner wants to put a card reader on the egress side to lock the door, that will then trigger a special locking arrangement and then we have to go through the process of elimination to determine which special locking arrangement will meet the owner's requirements. This symbol is the clear exit width of a door or stairs and with a little uh, pointing arrow. So when we see that, let's see if we can find an example. They don't even use this on this one. So this symbol is here and they're not using it. The fire rating of the door in minutes, they'll have it in a circle. Not all architects have that. Some will just have a symbol for the wall. MHO is a magnetic hold open. So if we see MHO, we know we have to include a magnetic hold open tied to the fire alarm system in our, in our set. This one is usually in a, rectangle just like this. So this would have the door number. The first number on top is the clear exit width required, 32 inches, and 19 inches, the clear exit door width provided. And I think they've got those backwards because I think that 19 inches is 
the width required, 32 inches is what's provided because 32 inches is the minimum clear opening width. The exit capacity, the number of occupants allowed, they've got 226 versus the actual occupant load of 192. So you'll see a box like that typically at the exit doors and sometimes they don't fill all of it in. They're, they're not filling the whole thing in. Uh, so some life safety plans are more useful than others. Others, you've got to kind of take clues and hints and put it together to get your own answers or at least put a list together for the architect of what exactly do you mean here. When we look at our occupant load calculation for level one, and oftentimes they'll include this in a chart just like this, an office building, just by definition, an office building is a group B business occupancy. But we're always looking for red flags. Do we have any mixed occupancy? Do we have assembly mixed in with the office building? And if we do, then we have to look even further. Do we have separated exits where we treat each one individually or do we share the same egress components and then have to pick the more restrictive requirements i've highlighted a2 a is assembly they say they've got 2765 square feet of assembly area with an occupant load of 121 and right now i've got bells and whistles going off in my head because this means it's a mixed occupancy. I've got group B business with a total of 77 people, and that's fine. The, that means my exterior doors do need to swing out because I have more than 50 people. But wherever this assembly is with 121 people, I've got to go take a look at that. And I did earlier. I saw this town hall, and a town hall is, by definition, when you have more than 50 people, it is assembly occupancy, and it's 2,765 square feet, which is what they're saying. So this confirms that this is what they're saying is the area of assembly. And when I have 121 people, how many exits do I need? Again, you don't have to type this in. I just want you to think about it for yourself. When we have 121 people in, an, in that area, I need to have a minimum of two exits. So let's take a look. This is the town hall. Here's a lighted exit sign with the arrow pointing. This is the egress side. And that leads me to this door, which is an exit. So there's one. This has a lighted exit sign. I can exit through here or I can also see this exit sign which points to here that's three and then here's another one pointing in this direction that's four so I need to I'm given four does anybody see any problem with this here though we have a card reader that's going to lock this door from the egress side. If I'm a spec writer working on this project, I now know that there's a problem. We can't use controlled egress. That can only be used in hospitals and nursing homes. We can't use delayed egress, which would lock the door for 15 seconds if somebody didn't use their card reader to un to disarm the device and allow them to go through freely without setting off the alarm. We can't use delayed egress in a group A assembly occupancy. If you look in your version of the code, chapter 10 of means of egress, delayed egress is not permitted in a group A occupancy. And access control egress or sensor release of egress door means I'd have to have a motion sensor on the egress side, which is this side, which defeats the purpose of the card reader because as I walk up to this door, it, the motion sensor would unlock the door and allow me to walk right through. And sensor, I mean, I'm sorry, hardware release of electromagnetically locked egress door would be either a request to exit switch built into the lever or in this case, it would be an exit device bar because 
in a group A assembly of 50 or more, I need an exit device on this door, the request exit switch would cut power to the mag lock and let me out the card reader, therefore defeating the purpose of the card reader. There's a couple things I could do. I can tell the architect, look, you cannot lock this door from the egress side as long as it's got a lighted exit sign above this door. You have three other exit doors from this space. You only require for this quantity of people to have two exits. If you make this your designated exit and this your designated exit, and then you've got this third one, you don't really need this one as an exit. And therefore, if you take away that lighted exit sign, then they could lock that door. Or they could talk to the fire marshal and in writing get a variance saying, even though you've got a lighted exit sign, as long as that fails safe at the time of fire, I will allow you to go ahead and put a mag lock on this opening. But these are the kinds of things that you're looking for on a set of life safety plans. The other thing I would be looking at is this large conference room. It has two exit access doors that swing out. It's not listed as assembly over in this chart because the 2,765 square feet is just this one section. So I would want to calculate and, and just see what size this room is. So with Bluebeam, I can go in and calibrate. I know this is a three foot wide door and I can calibrate and apply the scale. And then I can go into tools and measure and determine the area. And the area is 670 square feet if I round up. And then I could go to my egress calculator and under the occupancy use type under group A assembly, this tells me that a building used for assembly purposes with an occupant load of less than 50 is considered group B business. Note number two, a room or space used for assembly with an occupant load of 50 or less an accessory to another occupancy shall be classified as group B business. And the third note, a room or a space that's used for assembly that's less than 750 square feet in area because a conference room could be assembly if it were large enough to have 50 people. But this is saying if it's less than 750 square feet, then it's classified as group B or part of that occupancy. This is less than 750 square feet. So this is not assembly. And that's why it's okay to have just a mortise office function or a cylindrical classroom function or whatever type of lock. You have free egress from the inside and this is not assembly. You can also put it into the calculator if you want to, but this will be less than 50 people at 15 net square foot per person. But at least by looking at that, I know I don't have to ask any questions. I don't have to have any exit devices. So the exit devices would be on this door, this door, this door, and this door, as well as this door. And then this door becomes a red flag. This door really swings in the wrong direction. It needs to go in that direction because you've got more than 50 people that could be coming out of this space converging with however many people are coming out of here, this door with the lighted exit sign should swing in the opposite direction. Any questions on this one before we move to the next? All right, this is a nine story hotel and conference center. They give you the fire and life safety legend, the different, they use different colors for their fire ratings, which is nice. They not only tell you what the wall rating is, but what the door assembly needs to be for the rating. And for fire smoke barriers, they're telling you that it's a one hour wall with 20 minute with self-closing or automatic closing with positive latching. So this 
architectural firm has a very nice set of symbols. Their exit sign, same exact symbol as the last firm with a little arrow into the circle. They use a slightly different type, your door with the door width, what is the actual width is 36 inches, the clear opening width is 33, the egress width 0.15 per occupant. This single door has an exit capacity of 220. And just because I know the code so well, I know that if this factor is 0.15, that means this building is fully sprinklered. If it's 0.2, that means it's non-sprinklered. And what, the more that you learn these things and experience these things, the easier it'll be able to see the red flags pop up. And then the total occupant load of 173. The way they do the rooms, they have the room name, the occupancy group, the occupant load, the area per occupant, and then the square footage, the calculated square footage. So let's take a look. This is the ninth level and we have a pool. Pool is A4, which is assembly, as well as the terrace around. So between the pool and the terrace, the total occupant load for this space is 109, which means I need two exits or exit access doors. I've got one here, the lighted exit sign coming out here. And the other is through this event terrace with the arrow pointing this way. I've got an exit stair here. I have my other exit stair here. And then I notice that I have a horizontal exit. Horizontal exit is a two hour fire barrier with double egress doors and once I cross through, if there is a fire on this side, once I cross through this horizontal exit, I'm now in an area of refuge. I'm free and safe from the area of fire origin. And I still need to get to the exit stair to get out of the building. I'm on the ninth floor. A horizontal exit won't get me out of the building, but it'll get me to a safe area so that the rest of my path of egress is protected. And so on either side of the horizontal exit, we do need access to each of the stair, each of the stairs. And if we look at this event room, A2 means it's assembly, 94 is the occupant load. They're using one person for every 15 square foot, which is less concentrated assembly, and 1,406 square feet. They're saying that the exit separation is Here's the diagonal 61, basically 62 feet. So the exit separation has to be greater than a third and 30 feet is close to half, which this is a fully sprinkler building. And this is, this is perfectly fine. These two doors are not considered two separate exits because they're so close to each other. So really I'm providing one exit access here and one exit access here. The problem is, if these are my lighted exit signs, and I've got 94 people, half of them go out this way, half of them go out this way, how do these people get to the closest exit? These guys come around the corner, these guys come around the corner, and they all meet back in this corridor to get to this stair, and that's a problem because really we're only giving them one exit access because they converge back in the hallway. We have to, and we did talk to the architect on this one, relocate this exit sign to above this door and allow them, half of these people, because this door is here, we can exit through here into this. Once we get past this horizontal exit, we're now protected and so just by having the architect move this lighted exit sign over here, yes, we'll put exit devices on all four of these doors, but now these guys can exit in a different pathway. If this gets blocked by fire, these guys can come out through here as well. These are fire rated walls. 
this is a fire rated wall, we would make sure that those doors have fire rated hardware. This terrace is an assembly and it has 55 occupants, 818 square feet. They've got this door here and these two pairs of doors. Well, these two pairs of doors are not separated by a third of the diagonal. The diagonal is 44 feet. And these guys are only 10 feet apart from each other. So this has to be the other exit access door. That means this door swings in the wrong direction and becomes a red flag. And when we pointed that out to this firm, they said, okay, we'll just make these walls just a little bit tighter so that we've got less than 700, less than enough. We only have 49 people. And now this is going to be the one exit access door that gets me to this stair and I can keep this door swinging in. They just made this room a little bit smaller so that it's under 50 people and therefore they only need one exit or access to, they need to use one exit access door. Do we have any questions on anything that we've covered today? Hopefully you'll find this helpful. Uh, it takes practice to be able to see red flags. The more that you work with floor plans, the more that you work with life safety plans. Life safety plans are valuable, especially for our spec writers to help answer questions without having to bug the architect. But sometimes you'll find an area that still doesn't make sense or maybe they wanna lock the door from the egress side or there's something that needs to change. And I can tell you with 100% that architects do appreciate you pointing these things out while it's still on paper. It's much easier to change while it's still on paper. And if we don't have any other questions, I wanna thank you all for your attendance here today and hope to see you again at another Asa Abloy virtual instructor-led training in the near future.